Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual U Miami Health Talk. Enlarged prostate? Learn the latest in minimally invasive options. I'm health journalist Ileana Bravo, your moderator for this evening's talk, which is presented by U Health, University of Miami Health System. Tonight's presenters specialize in men's health issues, urology, and prostate management. You know, UHealth is a pioneer in minimally invasive procedures to treat benign enlarged prostate. Our doctors are also researchers discovering new ways to improve diagnosis and therapies and offering our patients the most promising advances, including access to clinical trials. We invite you to learn more about UHealth's prostate management therapies by visiting umiamihealth.org and by calling 305, this information is on your screen, and we're going to repeat it, so don't worry. It's 305-243-6090 to request a consultation with Dr. Kava, one of our presenters tonight, and 305-243-9808 to request a consultation with Dr. Bhatia, our second presenter. In tonight's program, we'll hear from urologist Dr. Bruce Kava, who will present on minimally invasive surgical trends in the management of enlarged prostate and interventional radiology. Dr. Shivank Bhatia will tell us about prostate artery embolization, a minimally invasive alternative for enlarged prostate. At the end of their presentation, we're going to have a question and answer session for our experts to answer questions that many of you have submitted in advance. Now, I tell you, there are many people joining us tonight for this very popular webinar. And don't worry if you haven't submitted questions, you've got plenty of time to do it doing, using the anonymous Q&A feature. It's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Take a second to locate it. And we're going to prepare these questions for our experts to address at the end of the presentation. So let's begin now, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Bruce Kaba, the Director of Men's Health at the Desai Seti Urology Institute, and a professor of urology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, where he's been on faculty for 23 years. A bona fide expert in men's health, Dr. Kaba has particular expertise in urologic oncology, sexual dysfunction, and benign prostatic hyperplasia or enlarged prostate, also commonly referred to as BPH. We're going to throw a lot of acronyms at you tonight, but I assure you our experts will clarify it all. Dr. Kava has authored numerous peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, as well as a chapter on essential communication skills for urologists for the American Urological Association core curriculum. He's currently president-elect of the American Society of Men's Health and has served on the editorial board of the Journal of Sexual Medicine and the board of directors for the Florida Urological Association. Dr. Kava, you can tee up your presentation and let's join me in welcoming Dr. Kava. Thank you so much, Eliana, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I just want to thank you for inviting us into your homes, your offices, and, and your virtual worlds, wherever they may be. We're, we're going to be talking, it's, it's a very exciting time here at the Desai Sethi Institute of Urology. We are really an institute at this point, and we're doing a lot of work on management of BPH, and we have some very innovative, cutting-edge strategies that, that Dr. Bacci and I will discuss today with you. I just wanted to start our presentation just to dispel some, some, some misinformation that people may have about what the prostate is. Prostate is primarily a fertility organ. It sits at the bladder base and basically secretes a, a fructose-rich acidic substance or liquid that helps bathe and nourish the sperm, primarily for fer fertilization processes. The, the PSA, which we often think of as a prostate cancer screening test, is actually a prostate-specific antigen or an enzyme that actually helps liquefy the sperm, allowing it to fertilize the egg. Beyond that, though, and beyond the fertility years, the, the prostate is really just a source for, for really, as, as my, my mom would say, it's sores for many men, as far as benign growth and, and, the, and, the, and the cancerous tumors that, that may occur. Tonight, we'll be focusing primarily on the benign issues with the prostate, and another, during another media uh, presentation, we'll, we'll talk primarily about the, the prostate cancers. But as, we, as men get older, the prostate primarily, beyond fertilization, now it acts as a conduit. You can see the bladder on the top there, and the urine has to travel through the prostatic urethra, or the middle portion of the prostate, in order to get out through the penis. As men age, the prostate grows. At some point, we something turns on in the prostate, usually around the age of 20 to 30, believe it or not, and the prostate starts to in, increase in size. 
there are a variety of different histologic changes that occur on the inside of it. But as the prostate increases in size, it kind of cuts off the urethra there, impeding the flow of the urine through it. Now, in, 20s and in our 20s and 30s, we barely feel this because our bladders are pretty young. They're vibrant. They, they get like a bodybuilder. The bladder actually gets stronger and it can push the urine out with, and, and it feels virtually seamless for us. But around the age of 30, 40, 50, we start to experience symptoms. These symptoms, we, we classify, we, we consider these symptoms lower urinary tract symptoms. This is an acronym that we, we use very often in urology. And, and as patients, you should be conversant with us about this. They're called LUTs, just for short. Some of these, these LUTs include storage symptoms. Those are the symptoms that, that give you the urge to go, give you more frequency, wake, wake you up at night. The voiding symptoms we cla are classified as those that include slow stream intermittency, pushing, starting, and stopping the stream. If you ever go to a movie theater at night, you'll have to wait for the, for the guy in front of you at the stall because he's basically pushing, st pushing, stopping, pushing, stopping in order to get the urine to come out completely. Then there's post-micturition voiding, which we'll, we'll talk about another time. What these do are they, they don't really, they're not life-threatening for the most part, but they cause bother. They cause bother in a man's life. And uh, this bother can create a detriment, detrimental impact on the quality of life itself. Now, this gentleman you see in the middle there is bothered by a number of things. He's bothered because he just woke up twice so far in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. He's bothered because he's worried that he's not going to have enough sleep to, be, uh, to have enough rest for tomorrow's day of work. And finally, he's bothered because he's probably going to have to see his creepy urologist again. BPH is highly prevalent in the adult male population. The box survey, which is a Boston survey, basically showed that up to 30% of men experience, of, over age 50 experience moderate or severe lower urinary tract symptoms. That's significant. Men are very good at denying a lot of things and, and just ignoring issues, particularly uh, this, is, uh, this is the way men act, basically. And then they wait until things get really severe before they start complaining. And so the box survey really disclosed that. Then the epaulets, which is a a video or an online survey showed significant numbers of men. 72% have at least one symptom, at least sometimes. That's a lot. So those symptoms include frequency, terminal dribbling. Terminal dribbling is may not be a bother of you, but, but for your spouse or your partner, that's a big bother because that dribbling on the, on the toilet seat or on the floor is a problem. Now, again, as, as most of you know, as, as I said before, that really isn't a life-threatening disorder most of the time but it can lead to some problems. BPH can lead to urinary tract infections, retention of urine, bladder stones, obstruction of both kidneys, blood in the urine. And most of the time, it will get worse over time. It's not something that usually gets better by itself. This, is, this certainly has an impact on our quality of lives. This is a study called the MTOP study, very widely cited study, looking at the placebo arm of a, of a uh, drug trial for BPH. And the placebo patients just get a sugar pill. They don't know it, but it's a sugar pill. And this showed that 80% of people at five years after taking the placebo are experiencing worsening of their lower urinary tract symptoms. 15% actually develop frank urinary retention where they can't urinate at all. They have to require a catheter placement. 5% develop incontinence, which is mostly urge incontinence. And then 1% or less will develop severe urinary tract infections where they have to be hospitalized. Now, how do we grade the severity of, of BEPH? This is the, the symptoms for the International Prostate Symptom Score, which is validated. It's a given in any urologist's office. Many of the primary care doctors give this out also. It's a, five, a seven question questionnaire, which, which goes up to a 35 as, as far as symptom, symptom scores go. So one to seven on this, and it basically assesses a variety of different things like the flow rate, the frequency, urgency, um, how, how um, often you have to push in order to get the urine started. And then it has a, a quality of life uh, question as well. So one to seven are considered mild. Those, those, those symptoms, mild symptoms, we don't often treat. Moderate symptoms and then severe symptoms are, are problematic. We also grade the degree of obstruction or the severity of obstruction with a urinary flow rate. This is what urologists do. We look at the flow of the urine. We have a little funnel that you, that you void into in the office and it measures the actual flow of the urine itself. And we could see the a normal flow is this bell-shaped curve in the center there showing the, how the urine comes out unimpeded. But the obstructed prolonged 
uh, flow is is a is a is more of an indication usually of obstruction there. Finally, we, we use the post forward residual of the bladder scan, which which most urologists' office have, and I think Dr. Bonchi even has one too. Basically, that that shows how much urine is retained in the bladder after you finish voiding. Over time, what happens is the bladder can actually get very uh, relaxed, and and does it doesn't give you that signal that you have to void because until it's very far, very very full. That's that's a sign of chronic obstruction. Medical therapy is usually the first line of therapy. These in, the medical therapies include tamsulosin, alfazosin. These are the alpha blockers, and they basically re, they relax the prostate so the urine can come out a little bit easier. Five alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride, dutasteride. Not only do they cause hair growth, but they also can cause the prostate to shrink slightly. Anticholinergic agents and beta three agonists are usually used for the bladder component of this. The frequency, urgency urgent continence sometimes, that stabilizes the bladder, which as it gets bigger, can often get um, involuntary contractions occurring. And then we found out recently that Tadalafil, which is Cialis, it also has some smooth muscle relaxant properties that also can be used for, for men with BPH and voiding symptoms. A variety of combinations of these agents can now be used as well safely. But what I will tell you is up to 35% of patients are either unable to tolerate these or, or break through with their voiding symptoms. The, the, these medications do not control them well enough. So that's why we still need surgery for BPH. Now I'm starting, we're gonna present a couple of surgical procedures now. Um, there's no gory goriness here, don't worry about that. But what I will tell you is that these are, the, the, I'm starting off with the transurethral resection of the prostate. TRP has been around since 1920s, believe it or not. It's undergoing multiple, multiple uh, phases and upgrades, and, and it's really still considered in, uh, in most authorities' hands, the gold standard for treatment of BPH from a surgical standpoint. What it involves is it's a, it's a highly effective way of scraping out that inner portion of the prostate, which is causing the obstruction. It results in an objective improvement in that symptom score questionnaire, quality of life, the flow rate, and it reduces the residual urine in the bladder significantly. This is really outstanding, the best you can get with, with this procedure. There've been many upgrades, low retreatment rates. It does require an experienced surgeon. It does require an, a general anesthetic. Most patients stay overnight with a catheter that has some continuous bladder irrigation going. And that catheter usually stays in a couple of days after the procedure. Those are the downsides of the procedure. Again, showing multiple upgrades. This is not the same procedure that I learned when I was doing my, my training, I will tell you that because we have so many things that have advanced this. We do it with, we used to look through the, through a, the telescope into the bladder. We're no longer doing that. We have video which, which magnifies it, high definition cameras. You, we're using saline now as an irrigant rather than, than um, the glycine, which was the previous irrigation system that had all kinds of problems associated with it. We've really improved the safety, the efficacy and the precision of this procedure as a result of all these upgrades. And this is what it looks like. If you'll take the on, the, on the left of the screen there, looking into the bladder, you're seeing the prostate lobe sitting together there, pushing and preventing you from looking into the bladder. At the end of the procedure, D, E, and F, now that, that tissue is now out. And you can see a wide open passage for the urine to come out. The same thing on the right side. This is a variation of that. This is a, a, um, a um, procedure where we actually uh, vaporize the tissue. This is another upgrade. It's called the button procedure. And this, this, this requires very high temperatures and the current going through that button just vaporizes the tissue. And so it does that with minimal bleeding. You could even use it in blood, on patients on blood thinners. That's how effective it is. And it really is very effective at opening up that, that channel so that urine can come out. And what we see is these are the outcome results with this. And I, I don't expect you to go through all the numbers here, but what I will tell you is the fourth column down, which is pre and post-op IPSS scores, IPSS scores for mid twenties, which is moderately symptom or severe symptom, they go down really significantly down below seven. So that's really showing you how effective this procedure is. The urinary flow rates, you can, you can put out a fire, basically. That's how, how strong the flow is after this. There are some complications and, and people have actually, if you go online and, and look at TURP, there's a lot of misinformation out there. First of all, the procedure is not the same as it was 15 years ago. The, num the number of upgrades that we've had in this have really made it very precise. And if you look at the bottom series there, that's really what we're, most of us are accomplishing now. Very few people bleed significantly. Very few people get transfused from this operation. 
TR syndrome is not is negligible at this point because we don't use the glycine anymore. Scar tissue, bladder neck tissue problems, incontinence, these are all almost negligible at this point. That's how effective this procedure is. Erectile dysfunction is something that everybody talks about after, after a prostate surgery. Many of people confuse the, the resection, the, the BPH procedures with the radical prostatectomy that we use for prostate cancer. It's not the same. In, in these BPH procedures, less than five to 7% of people have erectile dysfunction, but actually 30 to 40% of people will actually improve their erectile function after the procedure. Ejaculation is, re, is an issue after most of the procedures that we'll talk about. The ejaculation needs, um, needs some resistance proximally in order to come out the urethra. But most of the time afterwards, after these procedures, the ejaculate volume will actually go back into the bladder. So it won't be perceived as, as occurring, but the orgasm that a male experiences is still the same during sexual activity. And retreatment rates with the, beep, with the, prostate, with the prostate procedure we just talked about, TRP is very, very low. At, at, ten, at uh, eight to 10 years, 15% of people require a second. Now in the 1990s, they started looking at other procedures Technology has really been tremendous. It's helped us with the TRP, but it's also helped us develop a number of procedures. Some have come and gone. If we look at this, this is up to close to 50% of the procedures in between 1999 and 2005 were being done as minimally invasive procedures. If you look at the things there, the TRMT and TUNA are no longer used. These, these came and gone because came and went because they weren't durable procedures but a lot of experimentation, experimentation was going on. And now we have some really good options for people. The, the, the whole goal is really to improve the safety, to eliminate the hospital stay, eliminate post-operative catheters, rapid relief and return to activities for most of our patients and, and a durable improvement in the lower urinary tract symptoms with a reduced cost. Our surgical, this is our surgical menu for BPH right now. We, have, we still use open surgery on occasion, robotic assisted surgery for those patients with enormous prostates. And a lot of these patients also go for whole lep and a whole variety of things. We'll talk about size in a couple of minutes. TURP is still maintained as, as the gold standard, either monopolar or bipolar. And then we have a variety of laser options, green light laser, whole lep, and now thulium is on the, is, is on the verge of coming, uh, coming into the United States at this point as well. We have thermal options, which, is, which we'll talk about called the resume. Aquablation, which is a robotic assisted, uh, ro robotic assisted uh, type of procedure. We'll talk about that and we'll talk about your lift. And I'll let Dr. Baccio talk later about PAE. So this is the green light laser. What it does is it, it's, it's a laser that, that has a, an emission of laser um, amplitude similar to, uh, that, that is best absorbed by hemoglobin. So it's very good, it's absorbed by blood as well as the tissue. And what we can see in this, this uh, schema is basically that the, the, tissue, the tissue reacts with the laser to ba basically cause ablation of the tissue in a, virtually a bloodless field. The Goliath study, which was released in 2014, showed that the, the green light laser is not inferior to TURP, has the same efficacy, same side effect profile with less blood loss, particularly in patients on blood thinners. And that's what I primarily use this as. It's a wonderful option that people have. And we can talk about that for, for hours, but basically accomplishes very similar things that, that the, the TRP does with, with less blood loss. The homium laser, I'm not going to talk about today because I know Dr. Shaw was here a couple of weeks ago. He talked about it. the homium laser is, is used to enucleate or take the inner portion of the prostate out whole, push it into the bladder where it's morselated. This is primarily ben very beneficial for people with larger prostates who don't want to have an open surgical procedure or don't want to have a robotic procedure to remove these massive prostate lobes. Your lift is primarily for people with small prostates. prostates. I, want to, I want to bring your attention to the fact that I'm, I'm mentioning size. We'll talk about that at the very end because that's how we classify our, the candidates for these various procedures based upon the size of the prostate. So Eurolift deploys these little tissue retracting implants into which are seen in figure A there. That's the implant with a little piece of suture material between. The, the, um, the cystoscope or the, or the resectoscope advances into the prostate and pulls the lobes open. The, the, um, the implant edges there, the, the titanium edges of each of the implants gets absorbed into the tissue. So it's not exposed. We don't like things, generally, we don't like things exposed in the urinary tract because they, tend, because they tend to form stones. In this case, it retracts into the tissue. And this is a very, very nice procedure because it really opens up the prostate 
Um, it's really good for people with lateral lobe, primarily lateral lobes that are, that are enlarged. And it's good for patients with 20 to 70 gram prostates. It can be done in the office with a local anesthetic and, and no need for a general anesthesia. And, and about 30% of people, patients will not require a catheter afterwards. They go home voiding. This is what it looks like from, remember we saw before how you look into the bladder. This is looking through the prostate into the bladder. The ones on the left uh, is, is the start. The mid one, the middle picture there is with one implant and the, the final picture on the right shows both implants in place and you have an open fossa there. Is it as good, is it wide open as the T or P? No, but it's not meant for that. It's, it's a, for somebody who doesn't want a surgical procedure, they want to have an office procedure, they want a minimally, minimally invasive approach. And this is the data looking at the, at the IPSS scores. We saw before the TRP consistently results in the IPSS going down below seven. With the, with the, um, with the Urolift, the IPSS goes down to about 10. So there's still a little bit of symptoms there. But this is why most people opt for the Urolift. It's, it doesn't require general anesthetic, doesn't require hospital stay, doesn't, require, doesn't have any bleeding, but it also preserves sexual function, particularly ejaculatory function. There's absolutely no change in ejaculatory volume after the Urolift is done. The IPSS score, this is a TERP versus Urolift proceed. This was a randomized clinical trial looking at PUL, which is the Urolift versus the TERP in the red. And the IPSS scores for the TERP patients went down just a little bit better, a little bit lower, but not, sig not significant. The urinary flow rate clearly uh, is better with the TRP. But again, there's improvement in, in, the, uh, in the Urolift group as well. The SHIM score, which is, which is erectile function, did not change in either arm. That's important to recognize because even in the TERP arm, it didn't change. There was no change in erections afterwards for those men. And finally, for the ejaculation, you see a significant decline in ejaculation in men undergoing TERP, but the, the Urolift really preserved that ejaculation. This is something that we've been really, we're, we're really a, a center of excellence in this at this point. We've done over 150 of these procedures. This is called the resume procedure, which is where we inject steam into the prostate. I, did, I don't know how they figured it out, but it was, it was a great idea. Putting steam into the prostate basically cooks the tissue underneath the surface. The steam goes in through a convective current, so it stays in the confines of the prostate. And, and basically, it can be done in the office with a local anesthetic, or it can be done with sedation or nitrous oxide in some cases. It's an excellent option for those patients with smaller prostates again. This is what one of the schematics that we have for it. And basically, it shows how the, the uh, cystoscope enters into the, into the prostate here, it deploys a, a little um, a probe into the prostate, which then emits steam, 130 degree temperature. And the steam goes between the cells of the prostate, essentially cooking them. It stays in the confines of the prostate capsule. Now the tissue still stays there. So we have to put a catheter, there's some swelling afterwards. We usually wind up putting a catheter just for a couple of days while things settle down a little bit. But after a couple of days, the catheter that comes out, people don't experience this full symptomatic improvement until one to three months afterwards, as you can see, because that tissue gets absorbed, or some people will tell me that they, they will actually, it, it liquefies and comes out as a gel for a couple of weeks afterwards. But it does open up the prostate significantly, and, and you do see significant reduction in IPSS down to about 10 again, not like the TERP, but it's down, down to about the same as the Urolift. And the urinary flow rates go up significantly as well no change in erectile function. As far as ejaculation preservation, 97% success. Not 100, but 97%. And retreatment rates, again, with these, with the minimally invasive surgeries, you'll see the retreatment rates are a little bit higher, 20% at five years versus the 15% for eight years for the TRP. This is the other, this is another um, option that we're working on right now. And I hope to get this by the summertime. This is aquablation. It's a robotic controlled system which, um, which it deploys a high velocity water jet into the prostate and basically does essentially the same as the TURP. But it, the nice thing is that you program it to be very precise and, and you use an ultrasound probe to see the confines of the prostate itself and the edges of the prostate. So this, theoretically, and in fact, in, in practice, this preserves ejaculatory function in much better ways because it preserves the edges of the prostate, which, which are important in allowing for forward ejaculation. This is what it looks like. It's, it's um, 
we're in the process, hopefully, of, of getting this within the next few months. Basically, you control the, the, uh, the water jet, you program it in with an ultrasound probe that's sitting in the rectum. And so here you can see that the, the person is actually putting down the, the, where the water jet should hit. And you, you program that in. And then once, once you let it go, at that point, it does essentially, it, it shaves down the prostate. I didn't realize that, that they use water jets to cut steel. This is very, very precise, cuts down the prostate in a much faster way, manner than, than I could do a TRP. This is essentially doing my TRP with a little more precision around the edges, and it, and it takes down the prostate, and it's about five to 10 minutes, as opposed to an hour, an hour and a half under anesthesia. So it saves time, allows for, for patients to get recovered quickly and, and get into the recovery room uh, much faster. So we talked about a couple of options today. There, there, are, set, there are many options at this point. Again, I, what I would tell you is that 15, 20 years ago, we had one or two options, the TRP and an open prostatectomy. This is just amazing how technology has helped us advance in this field. And as a result of that, now we can really, um, we can make decisions for, for what's best for, for patients and in consultation with you basically, based upon the size of the prostate. Larger prostates still respond nicely to the prostate's surgery, the open prostate surgery or robotic surgery, the whole lep, thulep, and now we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Bacci about the PAE. That's the space that really the PAE is most effective. Average prostate size, you can see you have multiple options. Again, this is a, a push and pull, a, you know, a, you weigh your, your options with the side effect profile of each. And, and so I think it's very nice that we can really personalize our BPH therapy based upon these, these type of options that we have available. And then small, small prostates, again, have many more options. So for medically complicated patients, those on anticoagulation therapy, we never thought that we'd be able to do this, but whole PVP, which is green light, and thulep can also be done very safely. And as I showed you, the vaporization procedure earlier too. What I will say is that most urologists don't have, don't have control over every single option. Most of us have one to three options of, uh, that, that we do very well. I, I, I myself do the TRP very well. I do some, some of the, um, I, I do a lot of the um, resume procedures. I do open surgery as well and, and green light, but many of my partners do others as well. And, and you have a whole variety of different uh, urologists here at the department that can offer a variety, a selection of different things. And we, we have a great working relationship. So if somebody really wants a particular procedure that I'm not as adept in, I'll refer it to one of my partners who is. And now, unfortunately, we have to keep our, our latest member of our department, Dr. Baccia, who's doing approaching BPH from a different manner. It's actually, it's a very good thing that we have. It's been a wonderful relationship that I've had with him. And we've done a lot of good things for many, many patients over the years together. So I want to thank you. I'm, I'm going to stop there. So I'll let Dr. Baccia talk. Thank you, Eliana. Thank you so much, Dr. Kavan. Thanks for demystifying and taking the fear out of a lot of this. I, I'm sure that the, the hundreds of people who are tuning in tonight will appreciate hearing that it's all not that terrifying. Um, and Dr. Bhatia, whom I'm about to introduce, thank you for holding down the fort with all those questions that we're getting hit with. Um, Dr. Kava, you're going to take over the controls now on the questions, but uh, <laughs> let's introduce Dr. Shivank Bhatia, Chair of the U Health Department of Interventional Radiology. He's also a professor of interventional radiology and urology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Bhatia is internationally recognized for his work on prostate artery embolization for BPH. He has served as principal investigator on many trials related to this procedure, also known, as you've heard from Dr. Kava, as PAE. He has performed over 1,200 PAE procedures, delivered more than 100 invited lectures, and published dozens of scientific articles and peer-reviewed journals on the topic. He's also trained more than 300 physicians on techniques related to prostate artery embolization. Dr. Bhatia, it's all yours. Thank you so much for um, that kind introduction, Eliana. And uh, it's a true honor for me to be here and present this to such a large uh, audience and, and very engaged audience, um, I can tell from you know, the Q&A. Um, first of all, I want to start by thanking Dr. Kava for not only an excellent presentation, but you know, finishing it on, on a note uh, where he touched the, the most important thing related to the BPH management is one size does not fit all. And uh, I think the biggest take home from this particular talk should be there that PAE is not for everybody. 
and and so is Eurolip not for everybody and Resume is not for everybody. And I saw this in 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 Q and A, and I would like to on, you know address that that most of the patients will get two, three, four procedures, surgeries, alter, altering with medications throughout their lifespan. So, you know, first of all, one size does not fit all. And second and most important is that in, in BPH world, eventually the prostate does grow back. Um, some procedures have a longer durability, some have a shorter durability. Um, and, and I'll try to address those things as it pertains to, to prostate artery embolization. So this, this concept of embolization is em embolization essentially means that you're cutting off the blood flow to any organ in the body. It, the, the whole concept of PAE actually started around 2006, 2007 with some animal studies, but the first application in humans around 2008. Uh, it has been FDA approved since 2016. And if you look on the PubMed, uh, today, you'll find 700 plus articles uh, on prostate artery embolization with six randomized controlled trials. So in this talk, I will address the, the procedure details, how we select our patients and how we, we do this in a multidisciplinary fashion, discuss the current state and status of prostate artery embolization and address things like durability as well as side effects, uh, including effect on uh, erectile function and ejaculatory function. So as I mentioned, 2008 was the first intentional clinical use uh, by one of my dear friends in, in Brazil, Dr. Francisco Carnevale, who is a professor of interventional radiology at the University of Sao Paulo. And, and this, this slide is, is courtesy by him. Um, so he, he did the pioneering work and, and in 2011 and 12 is when he presented his first experience uh, of few patients uh, in one of the journals. So in, we have been offering this since 2013, and I did my initial training or observership with, with Dr. Carnivale in 2011, 2012. So I want to touch upon, as Dr. Kawa mentioned, that you know, as per latest AUA guidelines, now most of the treatment options can be divided into three categories based on small, average, or large size of uh, the prostate. And I do want to put a disclaimer, though this procedure has been FDA approved since 2016, PAE, it is still not included in AUA guidelines. It is still considered that it should be done only in setting of clinical trials. Um, and that's an, that's an ongoing thing. There are a lot of clinical trials, including trials we are doing here at University of Miami, and I will address those as well. This question I did get in Q&A, and I think it's important uh, for the audience to understand the, what is small, what is average, and what is large. So less than 30 gram is pretty much like normal size of the prostate, but it does grow with the age. So for a 70, 80 year old, if you have a 40 or 50 gram prostate, it's still pretty much normal size. Uh, 30 to 60 gram puts you still in a small category. 60 to 80 gram is a moderate enlargement. More than 80 gram is significant enlargement, which will, which will be like more in the large prostate category. And then more than 150 will be, will be giant. So the application of PAE is, is really around, around this zone, you know, some, somewhere around like 60, 80 and above. So let's talk about like the, the procedure, what, what exactly entails, what is prostate or prostatic artery embolization procedure. So this is an animation which is showing the procedure can be it's an endovascular procedure. Um, the procedure can be done through groin or it can be done through wrist where a very, very small catheter, catheter is threaded under X-ray guidance all the way just into the blood flow of the prostate. Once we confirm that we are in the right spot, we inject these very small, tiny particles size of grain of salt, uh, which essentially cuts off the blood flow to most of the prostate. But again, this is happening more at an arteriolar level, not really at a capillary level. So in spite of us cutting off the blood flow to entire prostate, you get around 30% to 40% volume reduction. These particles are, are made up of acrylic polymer coated with gelatin and they are positively charged. So they will stick to prostate. They will not move. They will not go to any other areas of the body. This is an outpatient procedure. It's done under conscious or moderate sedation. The procedure takes around one hour and no Foley catheter is placed unless patients come to us with a Foley catheter or they have a very high amount of urine they're holding. That's when we will put a catheter in. So how about recovery after the procedure? Three to seven days is the recovery time, which includes burning, urgency, 
um, bladder spasms, mild moderate pain. You can get some little bit of blood in stool and urine. These things subside by three days. Um, encourage normal fluid intake. Uh, activity restriction is two to three days. So that's the recovery part. Around five to seven days uh, is average. Benefit begins at two weeks post procedure. Significant improvement is seen at four weeks. And peak benefit is at three months and remains persistent. And we'll look at the data in terms of durability in a second. So I have uh, to thank uh, um, one of our patients who has agreed to share the video of his experience. Two weeks since my procedure. And I can tell you, I am a different person now. Uh, the first, I actually, I got on a plane on Friday, just 10 days afterwards. I didn't have to get up off my seat on a three plus hour flight it was great. Anyway, basically you really did very well. The first five days, yeah, you had the cramping that started to go away. The burden was probably the last thing that stayed. But seven days, I was already, I felt the change. After 10 days, the change was even more rapid. And I feel like, like I said, I'm, it's a, I'm a new person. Uh, my definition of urinating was stop, dribble, stop, start all kinds of random, all kinds of a few hours in the middle of the night. Now, it just start and stop. And I'm done for the night. It's great. And from what you said, the best is yet to come in a couple of months. But what a change. I feel I'm in New York or visiting. I just had a grandchild. I'm walking the streets. I don't have to run into any bathroom. But anyway, thank you so much. It's been really wonderful. And thank you to you and your team for making me a different person now. And, and again, I want to thank you uh, for, uh, for us to be able to use this video. So in terms of medication, you know, th this procedure, when, when, you cause, when you cut off the blood flow to any organ in the body, it does cause inflammation. So we give uh, something like Advil or Medrol dose pack to, to prevent that. And then every other symptom, burning, urgency, bladder spasms, prevent infection and constipation, we address with five different medications. That's the medications patient go home with. So again, patients go home like within one to three hours after the procedure. So when we look at uh, the different indications of, uh, of treating an enlarged prostate or low urinary tract symptoms related to enlarged prostate or urinary retention, there are some absolute indication and relative indication like urinary retention, recurrent UTI, renal insufficiency, hematuria, as well as moderate uh, um, PVR, which is like the amount of urine you are holding, moderate or severe symptoms based on the IPSS score, which Dr. Kawa addressed, and failed medical therapy. So these are like indications for in general. And then there are some PAE-specific indications where you have you know, severe symptoms or moderate symptoms, but you have a big prostate. You have a large prostate, more than 80 grams. Or you come, or, you know, patients present to us with a large prostate, with acute urinary retention. They went for a hernia repair, they went for knee replacement, and then now they are not able to pee. Or hematuria, as you know, this embolization, you're cutting the blood flow, so it's going to stop bleeding. Patients who are poor surgical candidates, patients who have failed surgical procedures, and I will address this, like 15% of patients I treated already had a prior TERP or prior HOLEP or prior Urolift or Resume or, you know, so, so, so those things are, are a given that, you know, you are going to get recurrence at some point of time. Men wishing to avoid sexual side effects, this is extremely critical. This procedure, just the way the mechanism is, it does not have any impact on erectile function or ejaculatory function. But because we are cutting off the blood flow to the prostate and we are killing a portion of prostatic tissue, you might see some reduction in the amount of ejaculate. That's, you know, really kind of most, most people don't find that as a side effect. And then again, we work in a very, very close fashion. So if you were to come to me and see me, I will actually have a urologist involved uh, in the workup and, and, and whatever opinion I need. So I, I do want to focus on this image for a second where you see this large prostate. This was almost like a kind of 450 gram. So there's no real upper size limit, you know, in, in terms of what size we can treat, but we start treating like 60, 70 grams and above, but more importantly, the prostate should be very nodular because these nodules are the ones which are very hypervascular. They are the ones which are going to take all these particles and then kind of like, you know, overall uh, disappear or, or, or die or, you know, cut ischemia. 
And, and this is a very, again, an MRI, which shows that there's this the pre-MRI before embolization and the lower uh, image is the post-MRI. Post-embolization where not only you see the reduction in the size, but you know what we call this and then outlier appearance where there are large areas of necrosis within the transitional or the central zone, which is the BPH zone, which is what we are targeting. And then here again, you see a very big prostate and then that's the post-MRI where you see this, this significantly went down in size, including the median lobe. Uh, and I just saw this patient for a four year follow-up and it's still doing fantastic. So in terms of success rate, 85 to 90% over a period of time, we have moved away from treating smaller lands and which has given us higher success rate, 60 to 70% reduction in the IPSS score, which is similar to what you get with invasive uh, procedures like TURP. Um, patients coming with acute urinary retention, 85% success in removing the, the indwelling polycatheter and making them catheter free, 85% success in resolution of bleeding, and 30 to 40% reduction in prostate volume at three months. So we recently, like last month, March, uh, we presented our 1,000 patient experience at uh, Society of Interventional Radiology in, in a plenary session. Um, and and, and this, this is where I think we, we have so much experience that we can share, like I, I will share my, my, my outcomes, but we, we can, we kind of like set standards in terms of like which patients will do well and which will not uh, in terms of prostate artery embolization. So the purpose of this study was to evaluate long-term effectiveness of PA in treating BPH with LUTs or urinary retention. 1,000 patients were treated, 856 for symptoms, 144 for retention with a median follow-up of over 1,000 days. And again, I want to focus on this for the audience, the prostate volume, average prostate volume we treated was 107 grams. The baseline average symptom score 23, which is severe symptoms and quality of life of five. Shin score is essentially moderate uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. QMAX and PSA, eight and six. And uh, um, the, in the retention subgroup, the prostate volume was 140. So again, we do this procedure through wrist or through groin approach. 82% patients treated through wrist, 18% through groin, 96.5% bilateral successful embolization. Procedure time mean around 80 minutes, one hour, 15 minutes. And again, we have improved tremendously over time um, and, and we have, you know, we are seeing most of the procedure under an hour now. So again, in terms of IPSS score, 70% reduction with the persistent improvement for up to six years follow-up, very, very similar uh, to, to TURP or, uh, um, or a laser procedure. And the QOL quality of life will always go hand in hand with the IPSS. SHIM score, as I mentioned, minimal impact on erectile function, if anything positive, as you can see the graph kind of going up. Or, or remaining stable in the follow-up. 32% um, reduction in the prostate volume at 12 months. PSA also goes down because a portion of the prostate is, is not viable anymore. So 43% reduction in PSA. Post-void improved by 61%. Post-void is the amount of urine uh, one is retaining in the bladder. And then QMAX, the flow rate, you're not gonna get it like TURP. TURP, you get almost 150% improvement. You, you get around 40% improvement in the in the max flow rate. Um, in terms of a retention subgroup, 86% uh, in success achieved in catheter independence at six months. Most of the side effects are self-limiting, frequency, urgency, dysuria, which I all addressed before. Now, when we go through radial access, there is definitely a risk of uh, uh, any kind of cerebrovascular event. That's true for any radial procedure in our experience, 0.3%. And then penile ulceration, which is a non-target embolization where particles kind of, we don't see, but they kind of go through the prostate uh, blood flow and go to the tip of penis, which we have seen four out of like close to 11, 1200 patients are treated. So around 0.4%, but all, all of them healed uh, very well. Uh, some, some patients with infection or sloughing off requiring uh, a turf. So around 1.5 to 2% uh, grade two or grade three events but no adverse effect on erectile function, no risk of retrograde ejaculation, and no risk of leakage or incontinence. This is very, very important slide to understand. Again, the durability, 15% um, re-intervention rate, what we are seeing currently at five years, 
Uh, compare this to TURP, it was 15% at eight years. I think by the time we reach our eight year mark, we are looking at probably close to 25% re-intervention rate. And again, that's true for any, um, any procedure for BPH. How many patients are able to stop or reduce the medication? Around 70% reduction in the medication intake uh, and around 50% are able to stop the medications completely. Just overall a meta-analysis comparing PAE versus TURP. TURP associated with significant more better improvement in the flow rate, prostate volume more improvement, and PSA will go down more. Again, you're, you're removing the tissue, so you're gonna get better outcome. But when it comes to IPSS, quality of life, erectile function, post-void, uh, PAE was very similar to TURP with a fewer adverse events. Uh, this is another of uh, our publication where we did a meta-analysis uh, of uh, all the different um, PAE publications to see the effect on erectile function and, and, and no, no study reported significant erectile uh, function issues. I do want to address this. Some people actually, if you read literature very carefully uh, in terms of ejaculatory dysfunction, 24%, 29%, these were outliers because the baseline was unknown. So they did not collect the baseline data. So to summarize, where would PAE fit in in the overall management of PAE? I mean, in management of BPH and LUTs and acute urinary retention, large prostates with or without retention, non-surgical candidates, risk of bleeding, patients on anticoagulation, very large like you know prostates up to 400, 500 grams, recurrent BPH LUTs after surgery, patients wishing to preserve erectile and ejaculatory function, and again, all these patients are worked up always in collaboration with urology and IR. So where PAE does not work, and I think this is the most important take-home slide, small prostate size, relatively small, less than 60 gram, very large median lobes, like more than four centimeter and above. Patients who have predominantly irritative symptoms, they actually need more of a debulking surgery, very high post-void residual with no symptoms or diverticular. You see like, you know, if the bladder is compromised, too much amount of urine being held and a large diverticulum, this is not going to be addressed with something like PA here. You need a procedure which is going to remove the tissue so bladder doesn't pretty much have to, has to do any work. Um, and then severe peripheral arterial disease with the with poor vascularization. And most important, I want to address and, and mention that PA is not for prostate cancer. There is like, you know, we, we did initially a little bit of a study on uh, patients with prostate cancer where we did embolization and they went for prostatectomy and there was no change in prostate cancer. So embolization is not for prostate cancer at all. We always, whenever we see any suspicion of prostate cancer on MRI, which we do baseline as a workup, we always send those patients to our urology colleagues. So I think this slide really beautifully summarizes, you know, the effectiveness of all these like TURP and HOLIP where you get 70% improvement in the, in the IPSS score or the symptom score, but they're not very tolerable procedure from a patient standpoint, really because of the, the risk of ejaculatory dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, some stricture incontinence. But as Dr. Kawa mentioned, there, there has been significant improvement in the techniques here. And then all these minimally invasive procedures um, like the TUMT, TUNA, thermal ablation, Eurolift, uh, which is right, right here, all these do not have those ejaculatory and erectile dysfunction side effect but you get only 50% improvement in the, in the IPSS score, much less than TURP or HOLEP. And there's a high retreatment rate uh, at, at five years. Uh, PAE, on the other hand, again, has a niche application in patients with larger glands, uh, has an advantage of uh, no inpatient, no Foley, no risk of incontinence, no stricture, no erectile, no ejaculatory dysfunction, retreatment rates of about 15% at five years. So at, at U Health, we, we really have uh, have placed. I mean, I, I personally have, have I would I would say given ten thousand hours of my life to this this program, and and I really want to say a big thanks to you know Dr. Kava and and the urology team, which I'll do on the next slide. So PA started in two thousand thirteen. We we did initially like significant in clinical trials, and again even even today we are running a clinical trial to compare PA versus Colip for larger glands. Um, we have defined the safety, the long-term success rate, the re-intervention rate. I personally treated, you know, close to 400 physicians. This does say 1,100 because that's what I've treated at UHealth. But if I include Jackson, BA everywhere, I've, I've treated personally over just around 1,200 patients and, and have been honored to be an editor, editor for, you know, some, some books related to that. 
and, and a deep, with a deep sense of gratitude for the Department of Urology to Dr. Parekh and, and all the urology colleagues, especially Dr. Kawa, whom I have worked with uh, since 2013 uh, on this, and, uh, and I, I can't thank them enough. So um, again, thank you very much, everybody. I'll, I'll, I'll give it back to Ileana, and then we'll have a slide back up again in terms of contact information because that was asked uh, by some people in Q&A. Thank you so much, Ileana. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bhatia, and uh, thank you, Dr. Kava, for holding down the fort on all those questions that you answered. I know how eager the audience is to, to get to our questions, so let's get right to it. Our first question is going to be for Dr. Kava. Does an enlarged prostate mean I have prostate cancer? We ask these, a lot of people have this concern. Or does it cause an elevated PSA score? So as, as I showed in, in the slide program, the, the, in general, men's prostates will grow over time. Again, at age 30, it, it starts. <clears throat> the degree of enlargement really doesn't influence the, the risk of prostate cancer. May make, it may make it more difficult to diagnose prostate cancer if there's a small tumor in a large prostate, but that, that's something that you'll take on with your urologist. And the PSA test and the rectal exam are primarily the, the way that we diagnose prostate cancer. Okay. So the, the fact that you have, if you have an enlarged prostate doesn't mean that you have a, a, a greater risk of cancer. And number two is also the, the enlargement of the prostate may actually influence your PSA test. The more pro, benign prostate tissue, the higher the PSA can be. So see a lot of confusion along these lines. Dr. Bhatia, here's for you. How much reduction in prostate size can a patient expect after PAE and is the reduction permanent? Yes, so that's, that's an excellent question. I did address it in, in our outcomes. So, so in our, our series, it was 32% mean reduction at 12 months. Now I do have to mention the larger the prostate, more the reduction. Okay, so 30% 30, 30 of 100 is much more than 30% of 15 or uh, 50. Um, and and the, the overall volume reduction percentage also is more in larger glands. So more, the larger the gland, the more percentage reduction we get. So somebody like 150, we get up to 40%. Somebody with the 60 gram will get like 25%. So, you know, it's both ways. It's, it's better for larger glands. Now, the next part of the question is, is again excellent that is the reduction permanent? Answer is no. You, you can do whatever you want to the prostate, it will come back. That's the, that's the truth. Um, and the more invasive you go, the longer it will take to come back. Okay, so on an average two to three years is where we see that the prostate will start growing back. But having said that, it doesn't mean that you will start getting symptoms at two to three years again. The prostate grows and Dr. Kawa can, can chime in around five to seven percent per year, usually. Okay, so based on that, if you got just like mathematically 30 percent volume reduction, two years of stability, five percent again, by year six, you will probably go back to where you started. So this maybe bears... the word where it's regrowing. I mean, it may not regrow in the area that that you that you yep. influence in order to to avoid the obstruction. Yeah, I think in the future our AI, AI technology will help us probably to recognize where the regrowth will occur, and that may be helpful as a prognostic indicator. Yeah, and and one more quick thing that you know this does not apply to everybody. If your prostate is prone to regrowth, it will regrow. I have people whom I have treated in 2014 from 100 gram down to 60 gram, and they are even today at 60 grams. So it's really doesn't apply to everybody. So it bears the question, is an enlarged prostate simply a condition of aging? That's a, that's a good way to put it. I, I don't consider it disease. I don't. I think that it is, it, is a, it is a process of aging. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, along those lines, are there any risks to not treating an enlarged prostate? Yes. Uh, as, as we showed on those slides, that there is, because most of the time it's bother. Most of the time we're treating patients for their bother and their bothersome symptoms and to make their quality of life better. I mean, living life, going to the bathroom every two hours and, and you know, waking up multiple times a night is not a pleasant experience. So I'm not going to down, you know, downgrade or denigrate that. But most of the symptoms that we're treating are really the bother. But in some cases, and again, that MTOP study that I cited really shows that very few people actually have life-threatening problems from the benign enlargement. Most of the time, the enlargement will persist. The voiding symptoms will get worse over time, but, but it won't necessarily uh, cause any real, real bad symptoms, yeah. uh, real bad problems. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree. The only thing I would like to add is that 
I would not want patients to or, or audience to just listen to this and say that, oh, you know what? Now I don't need to worry about this. It's very important that you have regular follow-ups with your urologist uh, because you will not know when your bladder will start getting compromised. Yeah. Sometimes you will not know. And your so bladder will start losing sensation and then it becomes a little bit late to intervene. So here's my question. Short of the symptoms that the man can be experiencing, how do you diagnose an enlarged prostate? Is it the ultrasound? Is it a CT scan? Uh, again, maybe demystifying and taking the fear out of this for men listening. Sure. I think first and foremost, I think it's the symptoms that, that signal us that there may be a problem. The, the degree of enlargement, and one thing that, that we've learned is that the degree of enlargement doesn't correlate with symptomatology. We have men with enormous, enormous prostates that have no symptoms. Their bladders have done a fantastic job of, of getting the urine out. Their, the configuration or the geometry of the, of the prostate allows for easier flow of urine in these individuals. But so the size doesn't really correlate with it. And so I do exams on patients all the time. I find enormous prostates sometimes where the guy has no symptoms. And on the same token, a, a moderately enlarged or a slightly enlarged prostate can cause a lot of symptoms. But I think I have to, I also have to, I, I was remiss, Dr. Bacci is correct, that we should, um, that men should see their doctors annually. I and mean, they really should. These are things that, that can be checked. And, and in some situations, somebody's prostate's enlarged, they may be retaining urine without even knowing it. Their bladders, as I mentioned earlier, bladder may get used to this. And if you're used to carrying around 200, 300 milliliters of urine in your bladder it, and you don't feel anything about it, that's a, that's a concern because that may be a problem later on. I had a gentleman this morning, actually, that I saw in the office who was complaining to me about waking up at night, going to the bathroom and wetting himself on occasion. And when I, when I did his bladder scan, he had 600 milliliters in his bladder, which is it's enor an enormous amount of urine to hold in there. He did not even feel it. So he was overflowing. That's called overflow incontinence when that happens. His bladder had no more capacity to it. That's why he was wetting himself. We, we so, are, are going to go a little over seven o'clock because there's sure. so many questions. So it's not yeah, a hard time. I, I do want to add, add one thing here that BPH is, is extremely common. So 60% of men over the age of 60 will have BPH. Um, doesn't mean that everybody needs treatment though. And, and if we look at like real numbers, around 20 million men in the United States are eligible for treatment of BPH. And let um, me, let's, let's reiterate this point because I saw in the Q&A a lot of concern about ejaculation, sexual performance. What is the impact of these uh, procedures on sexual performance and satisfaction? Yeah, I'll let Dr. Bach answer because this is going to be quick. Yeah. What's, what's the impact of PAE on sexual performance? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, if, if anything, we, we saw we saw around 20% of patients go from like moderate ED to no ED. That's the only positive change we saw. You know, for negative change, it was hardly one to 2%. And I think there was a lot of like, you know, other issues going on with the patients. So no impact on erectile function, ejaculatory function. You patients do see some reduction in the amount of ejaculate because we're killing off some portion of prostate, but you know, no retrograde ejaculation. Yeah. Again, for the urologic procedures also, since very similar. Again, a lot of misinformation about the, the procedures because people are confusing this with the prostate cancer surgeries that people undergo, which really affects the erectile function. It, most of these procedures don't impact erectile function to any great extent. Again, it may actually improve it in some cases. The ejaculation clearly is impacted by many of the therapies that we have, but some don't. And uh, here, here's the one that uh, I think a lot of men ask, and, and the Q&A was filled with this. At what point do you determine when it's time to see a specialist for this enlarged prostate symptoms? I'll let Dr. Tawa address, but I do want to mention that BPH is a progressive disease. So once you have it, you're going to have it for the rest of your life. So once you have and you have a diagnosis of like BPH, even with your primary care, then after that, you should see a urologist once a year for, I would say, rest of your life. Stay tuned. As, as um, Dr. Bacci mentioned, as, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I'm, I'll be, I'm the president-elect of the American Society of Men's Health. And, and we're developing a men's health checklist. It, there's been one published several years ago. It wasn't very well validated. We're really going through this with a fine-tooth comb to see what really 
men should be young, men should have done on a yearly basis. Uh, uh, the uh, University of Miami people put together as a, as a car model. What do you do for your, for your checkups or for your car? You do that as, as a male too. You should be going, make sure the prostate's okay. Make sure that you're not retaining urine. Make sure the symptoms aren't, aren't so severe that you need treatment. Check the PSA. There's a whole variety of different things. Colon cancer screening, there's a whole, a whole checklist of things that have to be done for men. And uh, so stay tuned. Two quick questions as we are starting to wrap up. Is there insurance coverage, Medicare coverage? And the second one is, can this be done with a uh, spinal block or always general anesthesia, any of these procedures? So Most of uh, you are oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I mean, our procedure is outpatient, just moderate sedation, patients don't feel anything. I mean, I tell them I'm better than a dentist. Okay, so so they, they I can literally do this with just uh, Valium, like like almost nothing. Just more, th th it's more of an anxiety which we're trying to alleviate, but it's a completely painless procedure, and they go home within one to two hours. So yeah, and and it's it's covered by insurance. And so yeah. Medicare covered most insurances. Yeah, yeah, most of the insurance will cover ours as well. We had some in the, when it, when a new technology comes about, that's when the when it's a little bit rough sometimes because they they. Insurance companies will play a little bit hardball at times, but eventually they'd let up because if, if the, the results speak for themselves, really. And so if the demand is there, they, they owe it to their patients, especially if you're talking about your lift is equivalent to TRP, green light is equivalent to TRP. The, the resume, I, I think, is very similar to the, to the, to the your lift. I think that these things are all providing very good benefits. And, yeah. and in some ways, they're, they're less expensive than the TURP, where you have an overnight stay and, and a whole variety of things downstream from that, which costs money. So we have still over 400 people with us tonight. So, so gratifying to know that they've been educated, they've received this knowledge to take the fears away. So give me the, the 15 second sound bites to each of our experts tonight to basically wrap it up and say, here's our take home message to our audience tonight. Um, so I, I would say that technology is, is amazing. It's really advanced the field of BPH therapy. We've gone beyond uh, one size fits all for, for everybody with, with an enlarged prostate. And we have so many personalized treatment options now. And, and again, it just comes down to you sitting down with us and discussing it. The, the Desai Sethi Urologic Institute really is a wonderful place to, to sit down with a, with a doctor and go through the personalized options that are available to you. And Dr. So you... well said, hard to follow that act. That's what I would say <laughs> in my, my 10 seconds. And I think, uh, I, I think you know, just, just uh, I would say that, uh, you know, when the time is right and, and if you're having problems, please reach out and please get consultation. Um, one size does not fit all when it comes to BPH. BPH is progressive. BPH does last forever. BPH does come back. BPH uh, is unfortunately here to stay. And, you know, it's, uh, it's very important to make sure that you don't wait too long to compromise your bladder and then your kidneys and then recurrent infections and stones. And, you know, that's when you get, get into real trouble. So, my, my, my punchline is that, you know, when the time is right, please get consultation. Do something about it. Something well, about I can't thank you enough, Dr. Kava, Dr. Bhatia, for the generosity of your time and for our incredible audience tonight, so involved. You see that uh, screenshot right there? Take a picture of it uh, for our audience so that you have all the contact information. Uh, it's UHealth, University of Miami Health System. Please visit umiamihealth.org. You've got the numbers there to request a consult with Dr. Kava, 305-243-6090. With Dr. Bhatia, 305-243-5509. And you people were wonderful tonight. Uh, take good care of yourselves. Yes, this webinar has been recorded. You will be receiving an email with uh, the recording, so you did not miss anything. You will get to see it in its entirety. For now, good night, Dr. Kava, Dr. Bhatia, our whole team. Thank you so much and everyone stay well out there. Thank you. Thank you to all the audience. Um, and thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night.